Hey, it's Craig Syracuse, and welcome to another episode of Walk in Faith, the show where we go beyond the image and we discover who our guests really are. You might know them from TV, the big screen, or even the world of sports, but do we really know who they are as a person? Do we know what motivates them? Do we know what inspires them? Well, that's what we're here to find out. On this episode of Walk in Faith, we're going to be sitting down on the classic stage with Daniel Roebuck. Well, thank you so much, Dan. I mean, this is a pleasure to be on your set. This is beautiful. I know it's nice. You know, I, we've I been doing get, this for uh, years. It's nice to have you part of our classic world. Yeah. How, do, how do I get a set like this? I mean, this is something special. You know, you got to know people. Uh, you got to know people like yourself. <laughs> See, but it's, it's the cobbler, you know, the cobbler has no shoes. That old story. <laughs> or the cobbler, what is it? The cobbler's children have no shoes uh, because you're so busy doing what you do we you don't have a nice set like this this is really nice but you know you've been you've been working with net tv now for a few years i think you've done it's got to be way over 100 episodes of classics and a lot of the viewers you know they know you they know some things about you they know obviously your, your amazing looks your uh, no, extensive knowledge on classic films you love horror films i don't know if they they know about who you are as a person Oh. I mean, I know a little bit about you. I know about your devotion to your faith. You know, I've been to your parish in L.A. where you, you helped build this beautiful sort of this playhouse. But you've been in over 300 productions, I would say. Maybe even more than that, which yeah. is, that's a lot. Now, I want to know more about you. Now, tell us, where did you grow up? Tell me about your, your childhood. Well, I mean, isn't it it's unique that uh, as a Catholic guy, I grew up in Bethlehem. <laughs> uh, the other Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So, uh, I... I grew up in, you know, Bethlehem's kind of a small town. Uh, it's a medium-sized small town. It was just voted, by the way, one of the 10 best secret places to live in the United States, wow. which, is, which is sweet. Uh, so I grew up in Bethlehem. I was born in the, and um, I know I look a lot uh, younger than I am. But uh, born, uh, born in Bethlehem, working class family. It was a great starting point because I, we were, when you're a working class guy, you're always trying to get ahead. Mm -hmm. Everybody works hard to get ahead. My father and mother worked hard to raise us. Uh, they sent us to Catholic school, uh, which couldn't have been easy, and there were four of us. And whenever I think of, I, as having sent my own kids to Catholic school, you know, 30 some years later, I think of the sacrifice mm -hmm. it takes. Uh, in LA especially, it's, you know, it's a hard thing. But so they sent us to Catholic school and gave us a good foundation of faith. As a family, we went to church. Um, what parish did you go to? We, were, we grew up in St. Anne's uh, Parish in Bethlehem. I was just at Mass there uh, two days ago. I still go back. I love going to my, my home parish. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's a familiarity to it. You know, like think about that. You grow up at a place. And maybe that, that's how it is here. Do you guys... But you, you moved recently. I so just moved, yeah. I, my parish was St. A's and St. Athanasius, which uh, Father Ron will be on your show. Oh, yeah, we love Father yeah. Ron. So I still go back. I don't go back as much, but uh, there's still sort of this, this sense of peace when I go there. To, yeah, to, yeah. Your, to where you grew up. But, but also as a dad and a father and a, and a husband, you know, you've got a responsibility now. You're in a new community. You've got to build your, you've got to, you've got to set down your Catholic roots mm -hmm. there. I mean, I, it was interesting in, in L.A. Uh, because there's so many, so many kinds of churches in L.A., Catholic churches. And I would base generally, you know, when I was a bachelor, I don't know if the other bachelors do this, I would have all of the bulletins before the Internet. <laughs> And I would wake up on a Sunday morning, See and what I time think, it is. Yeah, where can I, where can I get to, uh, where can I get to in time? So I didn't really set down parish roots uh, initially uh, in Hollywood. Then I eventually moved to Burbank, California, and uh, found found a church and started teaching uh, Sunday school there, wow. CCD, there. Uh, and then I took that on. To, I know we're, we're getting, I'm moving forward. Quickly, you were already we'll at go, like your retirement yeah, we'll go, age. Yeah. And we then, skipped over 40 years, yeah. but that's okay. Uh, oh, go, so, and then, so we'll get back to CCD. But grew up in this St. Anne's school uh, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And an interesting thing happened. 
that had a huge impact on my life and somehow it's only lately that I see how big an impact. So when we were kids, Catholic school, public school, didn't matter, you didn't learn how to read or write until first grade. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Like now you've you got your boy and you yeah, know, you're, already... you want him to be re read and understand. But, but back then the idea was, well, if they don't have a comprehension of what they're reading, what does it matter? Anyway, that was the job of your first grade teacher. Your kindergarten teacher taught you colors and left from right. And I, I have a birthmark on my, on my left arm, which is so almost not visible now. And when I was a kid, I was always good at left and right because they'd say left hand and I'd be like, <laughs> because I knew the birthmark was on my left hand, but I didn't know my left from my right. I just knew that's where. So in the winter, I always failed left and right because I'd be like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Where's my birthmark? Where's my birthmark? <laughs> um, so anyway, so first grade, uh, I watched some cartoon on TV, a Popeye cartoon. And in the cartoon, Popeye's nephews, they weren't Huey, Dewey, Louie. They were whatever the, oh, 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 whatever they were. Um, and uh, they made a movie in the cartoon. They animate like, they drew the animation cells. So the movie was, was talking about how to make a cartoon. And that, I, in my brain, at six years old, I said, oh, I want to make a story. So I drew pictures of a, of a play. And then I, I went into the, to the nun the next morning and I said, you know, like, you know, I'm looking for a prop because actors, actors have to have props. You know, I was like, I was, you know, like it would have been like, uh, sister, I, I wrote a play, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, and she looked down at the, you know, the drawings of a the scribble. potentially the scribbles of <laughs> uh, a potential mental patient, and uh, she uh, she changed my life in this moment, Sister Kathleen in first grade. What did she, she say to you? She said, "Let's do your play." So uh, she could have said, "Sit down, stop bothering me." There's a lot I have to cover today. I have to teach you a little more on how to read, whatever she could have said. Uh, and everybody has these theories about what nuns are and, and who nuns are. And I'm, I'm so depressed lately that nuns have become the punchline of every joke. Mm -hmm. And everybody says, oh, I, yeah, the nuns hit me. And I think, you know, the first thing I think is, uh, well, what did you do? Because it's never like, you know, I punched this kid and the nun whacked me or I cheated on a test and the nun whacked me. But I never had a nun hit me, but I had a nun change my life. So I look back at that moment, wow. and I'm, I'm trying not to, I don't want to overstate it. Like, I, I, I don't want to bore people with it. But you have to understand that before that moment, I was a kid. And after that moment, I was a creator. And we made that play. We did the play. She let me take two other kids out of class, and I didn't. she said, you got to rehearse it. I don't know what that Amazing. was, you know. So... Uh, and it was really, I would put the drawing on the blackboard and I'd say, in this scene, in this scene, the villain comes in. And then we would act that scene out. And then I'd put the next drawing up and I'd say, in this scene, you know, because I didn't, we would just talk it. So I do the play for Sister Kathleen and uh, she, uh, she says, uh, hold on, and the, we had like this phone system back then in school. And, she called Sister Margaret Anthony, Sister Margaret Anthony, the principal. Sister Margaret Anthony, could you please come to first grade? And I thought, oh, that's it. I'm in trouble. I'm. This is <laughs> must. I, this is the. This is how the critics work. We're already closing, and we just opened. You know. What? So Sister Margaret Anthony came down, and she watched our play, and uh, she said, Mr. Roebuck, you're going to do this play for every class in the school. And then that day, I took the play. And there was, you know, eight grades, two classes in each grade. So I went 16 times we did that play. Wow. And when you're in first grade in 1969, an eighth grader might as well be Buzz Aldrin. I mean, for all, you know, the eighth graders were gods to yeah, us. Yeah. And I remember coming back and the other, other kids were like, did you meet the eighth grade? <laughs> I did. I'm the eighth grade. <laughs> what did they, did they punch you? You know, because you know, you're so afraid of the, the eighth graders. So I toured that play for that day, and I look back at that as such a key moment in my development 
as an artist and a creator, and I credit one person, Sister Kathleen. Wow, that's a great story. That's I love. Amazing. I have such love for the nuns. I have such. My heart is so full of love for the religious sisters. I I think that the, our priests, you know, one might say they're the brain of the church, but the nuns are the heart of the church. I want to hear about that. I want to hear more about how that one moment sort of sort of directed your your steps and your path to your career as an actor. When we come back, guys, we'll be right back. Welcome back, Dan, thank you. That was a great first segment. So now, okay, that moment, right, the nun sort of influenced your life and your creativity and, and sort of sparked something within you. Did you know in that moment that, you know, this is what you want to do with the rest of your life, work in show business, be a creator, or did it take a little bit more time for it to sort of manifest? Well, it's a great question. I will tell you that about that same time, I literally started saying in my, in my conversations, well, when I'm on TV, I'll, when I'm on TV, and I talked about being on TV so much, my parents got me a cardboard television that I would pretend to be on TV wow. in this cardboard television. I think God put the idea in my head, and I feel strongly that we are all given our uh, personal vocation, mm -hmm. not, not a religious vocation, but our personal vocation. I think that, that God's talking to us always, right? And I, I would argue that the, the only difference between me and any other guy who wanted to be an actor isn't I'm not a better actor, I'm not a better looking actor, I'm not a, uh, I don't know, I'm just not a trained actor. But from the beginning, I, I, I got this intuition that this is what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And then I made every decision. So at six, you know, I was still a little kid, but I remember by 10 or 11, we were talking about getting an eight millimeter project camera you know, and making movies, which uh, none of us had parents that could afford it, so we weren't like the young Steven Spielberg. We never did it, but always, always, always. And then up till 12, 13, I, I decided, you know, I wanted to be in a play. In the interim, I had done impressions. I would do talent shows, I would do impressions. So I've been an entertainer since six, seven years old, in some way or another, and, and always had this idea that I was gonna be on TV. Now, I, I have my own kids and I mentor a lot of actors and I, I talk to a lot of young people and I'm, I'm starting to tell them now, there's this white noise, this, <laughs> this cacophony of, of be it uh, as you get older. Now, now it's their video games, it's too early an interest in sexuality that you know, they have access to, it's drugs, it's, it's things that, anything, the white noise is anything that takes you away from your dream. Mm -hmm. So I th wanted to be an actor uh, I worked toward that goal. I kind of decided I would be an actor at 13. Uh, if I could just say that uh, I was an entertainer, let's say, until I was 13. I did magic shows and talent <laughs> shows and uh, impressions. And then uh, I went to see a movie called Give Him Hell Harry where James Whitmore played Harry Truman. It was a filmed movie of a one-man play. And I... I saw it at 13 and I always say I walked into the theater an entertainer and I walked out an actor. Like I thought, I want to do that. That's exactly what I want to do. Why do you think you, like why do you think God put it in your heart? Because like you said, sometimes like with God, it's, it's hard to distinguish what we want as a person, right? In the sort of in the flesh and what God places in our heart. You were fortunate because not everyone sees that. Some people are, are sort of manipulated by society and say, I want to be an actor because of the fame, the insecurities, and the money, and other people want it because of the platform. So I think it's, it's hard to sort of balance it, but you were fortunate enough to recognize that well, this I, was a purpose, this was a dream. Why do you think God said, Dan, you're going to be an actor, an entertainer? Why did he give you this platform? Well, I don't want to get, you know, like I'll start getting weepy when I really think about it, but I truly believe it was to bring me to this point where now as a filmmaker, I'm doing his mission. Mm -hmm. So I needed to get to, uh, I just needed to get to here uh, and had to recognize the steps. And I'll tell you, it's not easy. You know, it's, it's not always been easy, but, but on the other side, anybody else who looked at it would say, how did you do? It's been extraordinarily easy. I went to Hollywood in 1984, and I was starring in my first movie, starring in my first movie in 1984. 
we're going to watch a show on Classic here where, you know, the girl, we, you know, the original Star is Born, the girl goes to Hollywood and she can't even get an extra job. And I was watching that last night preparing to shoot, thinking, you know, how much easier it was. See, the problem is if you think it's easy because I'm the most talented guy, then I'm an idiot, then I'm not recognizing God's hand in my, in my momentum uh, forward. And from the time that I got to Hollywood, and it's hard, you know, to give the time necessary, uh, you know, because I'm rehearsing at night or whatever to, to get to church. Uh, but I've always kept my love of God in my heart. And as I became more famous, I hate using that word, but instead of using the platform of, of my being on TV uh, as a means of making political statements or well, financial uh, gain uh you know and you know what i tried to do was uh use that platform to always start speaking in positive terms about our uh individual ability to uh to reach these dreams that we have and these dreams that god has for us i really think everyone gets it i think that the white noise is what keeps people yep. from hearing it and by the way sometimes that you know but you think uh, my old man, when I said I wanted to be an actor in Hollywood, he did what any dad would do. He jumped on me like he would jump on a grenade. Because why? He was afraid of my harm, first, people taking advantage of me, second, failure, how much that would hurt me, third. And he did what any dad would do. Mm -hmm. But it. But that's the white noise, too. Yeah, you know, you're right. With all respect to parents. I was doing a, uh, an interview on a radio show, or excuse me, a TV news show, and the news commentator said, he goes, you know, we, we talked about these kind of things, and he said, I feel bad because my daughter wanted to be an actress, and I told her no. And I, I said, you did your job as a father. She didn't do her job as an actor. Her job was to ignore you. I, I want to actually get into that when we come back because I, I just had the same conversation with my wife. Be right back. Welcome back. It's funny, you know, you brought up about, you know, how we sort of protect our kids. So I was at, t talking to my wife about this. I said, when we're young, right, we tell our kids, you could be anything you want in the world, right? Anything you want. But then at a certain point, society or we feel the need to, one, give up on our own dreams, right? The justification is, you know, I have a family. I have to, I have to you know, I have to settle down. So then our kids see that and our kids get older and they, they want to be an act. They want to be whatever they want to, whatever they want to follow their path. But at a certain point, they'll follow our footsteps and they'll give up on their dream and they'll blame it on the same sort of situation. So it's sort of like we confuse them in a way where we tell them to follow their dream, but then we're there to protect them. No, we, it's so interesting we're talking about this. So I, I was driven here today by a young man, you know, an Uber driver who's a musician. In our 12, 12 minute ride, I learned that his parents are Korean. He's dating a Chinese girl. They don't like that. He wants to be a musician. They want him to have another job. So, so here's a guy who, A, is in love with someone, and B, has a dream of being a creator, and his parents are imposing a different rule on him out of, out of you know, their love for him. But it's, there is no love. You do not love someone if you do not let them be who they need mm -hmm. to be. Now, look, it's a complicated world now. But our job as a parent is to get that kid to, I feel, to 18 as a gracious, faithful human being. Faithful. If we can get them to always go back to their faith, they'll always go back to positive moral and ethical choices. How do we do it? If we give up on our dreams uh, and we say to our kid, you know, you, you think about, I, I just think, I can only talk from my point of view as a parent. I've never told my kids they couldn't be something. I've only ever said you could be what you want. And I've also, as a parent, one of my kids is really great at school and the other isn't. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to impose the, the, the great at school kid's grades on the other kid. He's never going to have them. So why should he feel like a disappointment his whole life? I wasn't good at school. I didn't go to college. I'm a relatively successful person without a college education because it wasn't, I, and I have no regret for not going to college. I'll tell you what I have regret for, I didn't serve my country. I wish that I could have figured out a way to go into the service, 
to serve mm -hmm. my country, so I could have at least done that. Uh, but that wasn't in God's plan either. That mm -hmm. would have been white noise too, unfortunately, to, to get me uh, to where I am. I just think it's a really good question. I think as parents, we gotta we just got to be careful that that we don't try to make their life our life. Our life mm -hmm. is our life. Our wins and loses, failures and successes only belong to us. They get to have their own shot at it, whatever it looks like, however they want to do it. Uh, if we can just direct them to the church and to exactly. their faith. I think that's, that's the key is that key. you listen to what God placed in your heart. So you had faith. You weren't walking by sight. You knew this is what God wants me to do. So you were able to drown everything else out. And I think a lot of people aren't able to listen to that voice. So if it's your father or my father or my mother or my wife, whatever was placed in their heart, since they sort of ignored that calling, they feel like they didn't, it's the same thing with their kids. Like unless you really follow what God places in your heart, you know you're gonna be an actor or, or an artist or whatever it is, and you follow that path, you will be successful because you're not working for yourself. You're working for something more than, it's not a self-serving purpose. And you also you need have to, to follow that plan. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but the other thing is success. Okay, there's so many ways. Say I didn't become the actor I became. Maybe I ended up being a community theater actor. Maybe I came to Hollywood and it didn't work and I went back. I would never have thought I failed God's plan for me or he failed, he failed me. I would have just thought, oh, I didn't really clarify it in my head mm -hmm. or I had thoughts of grandeur. Not everybody gets to be a movie star. Uh, and then, when, by the way, sometimes you're a movie star and then, you know, I'm a movie star in one movie, but in the next movie I work mm -hmm. five days. I don't really care. I never actually said I wanted to be a movie star. The only calling I got was that I was going to be an actor. So movie star wasn't even in, it's not, someone will say to me, I remember when you were a kid and you said I was going to be a star, and I say, that's a lie. I never said it. I only ever said I want to be an actor. That's and all I ever said. And now tell me before we wrap up, I want, now you, you mentioned earlier about the two films and how sort of God led you to this, this spot. Now tell me a little bit about it. The first film is... is first film is Getting Grace. Getting Grace. It's an allegory for God's grace. Uh, a lovely film about a teenage girl dying of cancer. Goes into a funeral home to find out what's going to happen after she dies. Ends up teaching the funeral director how to celebrate his life. That's great. Uh, God's grace is available to all of us, regardless of whether we recognize it or not. That's, that's the, the, sp the special thing about the grace of God that people kind of, you know, you don't, I, that's a, in this new movie I'm writing, a guy says, I don't believe in God, and the nun says, uh, you know, good news for you, he believes in you, so it doesn't really matter like what you that. believe. Um, so that was uh, the first movie, and it's had such an impact on people, uh, and all I've wanted to do is move the needle a little. Like, I can't, I, I'm not, I, I can't say that I can change the world, but if I could change one or two people's outlooks, there's something better for all of us. And really that movie, by the way, that movie is about living life every day. I used to say like living life every day like it's your last, but really we have to, we have to live every day like it's our first. Mm. Every day, I always, I, God was very smart. He put the sunrise and the next, so the next day you can wake up and you can go, I forgive, what do we say? Uh, we don't want to trespass against them and forgive those who trespass against us. So you could do that every morning. Everybody, everybody flipped you off the next day. You wake up and you go, it, that, you know, I don't care about that. Exactly. People bring the anxiety, not just of a day. You know friends, people, they, they're mad at their parents for something their parents did 40 years ago. And you think, are you crazy? Exactly. It's stopping you. You're stopping your forward momentum. That's white noise. Uh, so anyway, that's the first movie. The second movie, I know we're almost out of time, is called The Hail Mary. I'm writing it now and we'll okay. be hopefully shooting it uh, early next year. And that's about a, a nun, an irascible nun, who identifies this guy who needs a shot at redemption. Uh, and so she cons him into creating a football team for her all-boys Catholic school wow. so that he can find uh, his, his purpose. And I went to the nuns. I have the Sisters of St. Joseph of Philadelphia, who are my nuns, who uh, are my advisors. And the, the nun there said, you, you're telling me you can make a movie in which you make nuns seem like a real person? And I said, I am. And she essentially said, I dare you. Wow. Uh, so 
she's thrown down the gauntlet, so I've got to have a... Got to have that done. Yeah, I'm sick and tired of the nuns being, I'll say this a million times, they're the punchline. And, and, and I'm moving them to the storyline, and I'm sick and tired. I watched a terrible movie, I don't even want to say the name of it, in, in which uh, they, they suggested, perhaps, that women who become nuns are failed, have failed at other parts of their life. It was a hateful movie, uh, and I think the nuns are the heart of our church. Mm -hmm. The heart of our church. Without nuns, I wouldn't be sitting here with you today because I would not have the, the foundation of faith I have or the moral and ethic foundation that I have. My parents did a great job too, but the nuns were the exclamation point. Well, I look forward to seeing those films, Dan. Thank you. Hopefully we can have them on classics in a few years, you know. And Why not? Well, thank you so much, Dan. Right, it's always thank a pleasure. You. God, a, bless. God bless you. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Well, that's another episode of Walk in Faith. I hope you enjoyed it. Always remember, we have the ability to evangelize and inspire through our words and actions. Till next time. <laughs>